In this video, I take you through a Zenker's diverticulum repair step by step, giving you key tips and tricks. We'll use a clinical case based scenario to highlight Zenker's diverticulum repair. A 64 year old male with progressive dysphagia and one episode of aspiration pneumonia had a PEG tube placement and was told he would not have ability to swallow without risk of aspiration. He was sent for a second opinion. Workup by our group with an esophagram and an upper endoscopy revealing a greater than 3 cm Zenker's diverticulum. We approached this patient with the Zenker's diverticulotomy repair using a flexible upper endoscope, a standard cap placed at the tip of the upper endoscope, a wire and an over tube, and then finally endoscopic scissors which we would typically use for an ESD. This type of ESD knife provides a variety of advantages including its ability to perform both cut as well as coagulation, and finally its ability to rotate along the appropriate axis to perform appropriate dissection. Here's our initial assessment of the Zenker's diverticulum. You can see this deep Zenker's pocket in the posterior aspect behind the esophagus. Here we go through the Zenker's diverticulum, take a look at the entire esophagus. You can see there's a balloon from the peg tube and the body of the stomach, and here we're evaluating further with a cap. My goal here is to take you through some of the key steps in endoscopic diverticulotomy. I often use a submucosal injection. The value of this is it can help with visualization as you dissect through the layers, including mucosa, submucosa, and then down into the cricopharyngeal muscle and beyond. Here you're seeing initial mucosal incision with that scissor style ESD knife. We're going to perform a cut. Oftentimes the mucosa can be rather thick in this area, though the muscularis mucosa just below it may not be as thick. Here you're seeing dissection into the submucosa, and you can see some of the blue hue that's been picked up by the methylene blue injection that I performed initially. That white film-like blue layer is important to note, because once you get beyond this layer through the submucosa, you'll see exposure of that cricopharyngeal muscle, which you can see just a little bit in this picture. It's important to understand the layers so that you perform a complete dissection, reducing the risk of recurrence. Also, utilize the cap. The cap can allow you to separate these layers and provide better visualization, especially to get deep into that cricopharyngeal muscle or down into the base of the Zanker's pocket. Here you can see a very nice clear view of the different layers as you should note. The mucosa, the submucosa, and the exposure of the cricopharyngeal muscle. Understanding the layers will keep you away from complications, but also allow you to perform a complete dissection. One of the pitfalls in the flexible endoscopic approach is the lack of complete dissection of all cricopharyngeal muscle fibers which can lead to elevated levels of recurrence if not properly performed. Here you're seeing dissection of that cricopharyngeal muscle and you're starting to see this white film-like layer just below the muscle. We'll see a closer up view of this. It's important to dissect all of the muscle fibers to reduce the chance of recurrence and get the best potential outcome for your patient. Here you're starting to see the last final layers of the cricopharyngeal muscle and you can see just a few strands of cricopharyngeal muscle left along with this white film-like layer which is the buccopharyngeal fascia. It's very important for us to recognize the buccopharyngeal fascia and dissect all of the final muscle fibers. Here you're seeing final completion of that dissection. Ear, nose, and throat physicians are very familiar with the buccopharyngeal fascia. Those who may have a background in general surgery or gastroenterology may be less familiar and it's important to recognize this layer for complete dissection. Just below the buccopharyngeal fascia remains the retropharyngeal space, the alar fascia, and then the danger space and prevertebral fascia. Remember, we're dissecting posteriorly, and there are only thin layers below the buccopharyngeal fascia. After complete dissection of all of the cricopharyngeal muscle, we do additional shaping. In particular, it's important to dissect some of the posterior wall of the esophagus slightly. This leads to decreased recurrences as well as potentially better alleviation of dysphagia. This has been shown in some of the ENT literature and by some of the ENT experts in various teaching videos. Here you're seeing some dissection along a portion of that posterior wall to make sure that we completely flatten the pouch. A nice additional trick is shaping the pouch, which I've picked up from some of our ear, nose, and throat colleagues. Here you can see dissection of additional mucosa and submucosal tissue. This allows the pouch to be more flat, the resection of the redundant tissue is also notable on your postoperative esophagram and may have long-term durable effects for the patient. Here you can see the post-resection area nicely flattened out. Occasionally we'll use one or two clips at the base of the resection plane. 
Key tips and tricks, know your tools available and utilize, recognize the layers and anatomy, complete dissection to the buccopharyngeal fascia and shaping of the pouch have all been discussed in this video. We hope that this video is helpful for those who wish to improve their skills in endoscopic diverticulotomy. When performed with the optimal technical approach, endoscopic diverticulotomy can have an immediate impact on a patient's everyday life with long-term durable effectiveness.